This is Resonance 104.4 FM. Flipping marvellous. How are you? Tis I, Nick Hennigan, coming at you once more with a slice of literary London on uh, Resonance FM. Also, of course, on BohemianBritain.com, my new mess of a blog. <laughs> yeah, check it out. It's a real mess. Anyway, uh, but I, you know, I have fun. I have fun doing it. Um, and I, I hope you're. I hope you're well. Um, it's literary London, as I say, where we look at things literary and London. And I had an email in the week. Did you? Nick? Yes, I did. Um, and it's uh, from uh, Debbie. Debbie, who is in Chelsea, and she said, uh, "I understood a few years ago you were involved in Dylan Day." And Dylan Day, in case you don't know, is Dylan Thomas's kind of official celebration. Um, and I was. And we arranged various things uh, in London. Um, Griff Reese jones you know, the comedian and presenter, uh, was involved as well. Uh, and we're going to do Dylan Day again this year. It's in May. His birthday, Dylan Thomas's birthday, is actually in October. Um, but I think Dylan Day is, if I've got it right, the 14th of May. Um, and we aren't going to be doing... Uh, special events, but we are going to be doing a special Dylan Thomas literary pub crawl. So if you want to know more about that, go and have a look at, um, what is it, LondonLiteraryPubCrawl.com www.londonliteraryPubCrawl.com We're going to be doing Dylan Thomas Day and I'm going to have, I I used to do a radio show that lasted an hour, you may remember. Quite often I'd do a Friday night live from London Bridge and we'd have guests coming in and then occasionally I'd go out and record people and one of the people I occasionally went out to record was Griff Rhys Jones. Griff talking about uh, Dylan Thomas and of course I think Griff brought out a book actually I should check it up, it's been a while since I've seen him called How Welsh Am I? Uh, but of course, um, he gets all over the place. He's a good chap, is old Griff. Um, and I'm going to chat with him and see if we can use some of his old footage. As I say, these are hour long radio shows uh, that I used to do. And I thought I'd kind of rehash a few of them, particularly because, as I say, Debbie from Chelsea got in touch. She said, I understand you're doing Dylan Thomas Day. Is it true he used to drink at the Fitzroy Tavern? Well, yes, it's true he did. Dylan Thomas actually met his wife and fell in love. At first sight, in the Wheatsheaf pub on Rathbone Place, just round the corner, which is actually where we start our London Literary Pub Crawl. Now it goes out, um, well, at least every week. Saturdays at five o'clock. Uh, and uh, depending on who's running the tour, sometimes I do it myself, sometimes Richard does it. And if Richard's doing it, you'll be lucky to get in. You'll be lucky to get finished by midnight. No, I'm joking. But um, he, he likes, he, he enjoys what we do. He's a writer as well. We're not a travel company, as you probably gathered. He uh, he tends to enjoy going out and sharing the love a little bit. I talk about sharing the love. That's kind of what we're doing about uh, some of the famous writers that lived on our manor, Fitzrovia and Soho. Uh, and so I was uh, minded uh, to play this interview for you. So it's going to be in two parts. I'm going to play you the first part this week and then the second part next week as a kind of a build-up to Dylan Thomas Day. Um, and uh, Dylan Day, by the way, is the anniversary of the first reading of Under Milkwood in uh, in America. Uh, which and I, someone did make, make the point that it's probably better to have a, a celebration of Dylan Thomas in May rather than in October during his birthday because the weather's not so nice. And that may be the truth. That may be the truth. Uh, but um, it's a fascinating area, Soho and Fitzrovia. And oh, this was I think in. Let me just have a look. If I got it written down, I think it was 2013. I'll turn my email off, shall I? In 2013 uh, or 2015, 2016. Anyway, a while ago. I interviewed Sally Fiber. Now, Sally is the daughter of Pop Kleinfeld, who was the man who kind of made the Fitzroy Tavern what it is today. He arguably is the reason why Fitzrovia is called Fitzrovia. And um, Sally was not too well when uh, I recorded this. And it was the very first Zoom call I'd ever done, actually. So that shows how long ago that was. Um, and I think Sally now, sadly, is no longer with us. But her book about the uh, Fitzroy Tavern is still in print. It's still around. And I'll put a link to uh, to that book on bohemianbritain.com. Um, uh, uh, yes, I will do. And um, so what I thought I'd do, I, I thought I'd share this with you because it's a fascinating history of how a brilliant pub started and how a lot of the kind of literature and the writers and the readers and the characters that were around Soho and Fitzrovia back in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s. So let's go back in time. This is me talking to Sally Fiber. Uh, Sally Fiber, hello Sally, how are you? Hello, I'm I'm fine. Nice to speak to you Nick. Um, and also it's probably worth mentioning we're actually doing this down the line because you're not you're not particularly well at the moment, are you? So this was—you're at home at the moment. I'm at home, uh, 
and in spite of all my uh, medical problems, I'm I'm still um, active and doing what I can do. <laughs> Brilliant. Well, we're going to talk about your book, and it's called The Fitzroy. And it's unusual for all sorts of reasons. Well, I love it anyway, because I've, I've, I'm quite new to London and quite new to Fitzrovia. And uh, we started the London Literary Pub Crawl from the Fitzroy Tavern. And the reason I did that was that I literally was sitting downstairs in the Artists and Writers Bar and looked at some of the photos, which will be well known to you, of course, looked at some of the photos uh, around the walls and thought, God, there must be some stories here. So I put together a, 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 a literary pub crawl based on... Uh, the Fitzroy Tavern and the Wheat Sheaf and Dylan Thomas and, and Augustus John and all those sort of people um, that were that were around sort of between the wars and, and afterwards. Um, and the glory is that you were there as well, <laughs> or at least you were. The, the 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 book is called The Fitzroy and it's the autobiography of a London tavern. So what a great idea! Just explain your connection with the Fitzroy Sally, which I know, but just explain it to anyone who doesn't. Well, my, my connection really starts with my grandfather, whose name, his name is Judah Morris Kleinfield, but everybody called him Pop. And he took over the tavern uh, and became the first landlord in 1919. Um, and because he was a Polish-born immigrant Jew who came to this country in 1886, He'd learnt to speak English very well, but he couldn't really write very well in English. So he needed his educated daughter, Annie, who was just about to leave school, to help him run the business. Now, she was only 15. His three elder uh, children, sons, were all serving in the First World War. So he had to get special permission, and from the age of 15, my mother, Annie, came with her father to the pub and that's when he took over. At that time that previously it had been called the Hundred Marks because there were so many German people in the area but now with the end of the First World War they went, wanted to change the name and reverted it back to the Fitzroy Tavern, the original name uh, of the uh, pub when it was really first established as a coffee house um, and uh, that's really uh, when I came in obviously my mother was 15 years before she married in 1936 and then I was born in really 1934 I was born in 1936 actually in the tavern fantastic so you were yeah born in the pub <laughs> I was born and, and many years later my mother told me I was conceived as well and I <laughs> best to be the most pure bred Fitzrovian of all. <laughs> Fantastic. Just, just for, because uh, we have a lot of people listening, particularly on the London Literary Pub Crawl.com podcast, just explain where Fitzrovia is in, in London. Fitzrovia, when my grandfather and parents took over the pub, um, it was in an area of London that didn't have a name. It was situated between Bloomsbury, it was Upper Soho, but um, in 1940, um, well, at least before 1940, my grandfather used to call the customers the Fitzrovians. And in 1940, the first William Hickey, who was actually Tom Dryberg, the MP, wrote an article um, in the Daily Express referring to the area as Fitzrovia. And somehow this started to give it an official um, because it was in print and now as you know uh, Camden and London is adopted and that is the area which really stretches from north of Oxford Street up to Euston Road to, from uh, Tottenham Court Road um, right over to really um, Port, Great Portland Street which is the area of Fitzrovia. It's a place uh, I'm very fond of uh, for all sorts of reasons. And it's kind of odd, really, because uh, you're not actually living in Fitzrovia now, although you did a long time there. <laughs> but it's, it's sort of... The first 17 years of my life. <laughs> that's, that's fairly that's good, isn't my it? my home. 
And yeah. we, and we, uh, I mean, uh, we'll be talking on this show as well to Griffiths Jones, the comedian and writer who, of course, uh, still lives in Fitzrovia, and he's a great fan of it. And I was involved in the Dylan Thomas in Fitzrovia Festival as well uh, last year, marking Dylan Thomas's centenary. It's got a, a kind of great feel about it still, hasn't it? There are lots of small shops, and uh, what Griff was saying, you know, there are sort of art supplies still. There, uh, it, it was kind of known. Uh, Dylan Thomas, of course, went to Fitzroy because he'd heard about it in Wales. So it was sort of known for its bohemians. And and really, it, is it fair to say that the Fitzroy Tavern was at the centre of all this? The Fitzroy Tavern certainly was the centre, and that's why um, the name Fitzroy developed because of the way that the Fitzroy had become the central shrine of this area, which attracted so many people. Yes. And that's why why the name was developed because of the pub and mm. not of the Fitzroys that he, who originally owned the land uh, uh, of, of that area. I quite love that, yeah. We, we say that on the tour as well, that, that this, the pub gives its name to the area rather than the other way around. Yes. Although, although it was Sir Charles Fitzroy. Was it Sir Charles Fitzroy? I've got me Fitzroy. It was wrong. Charles Fitzroy because it was quite a coincidence that my mother was Annie and my father was Charles and often he was called <laughs> Mr. Fitzroy. Brilliant. <laughs> so the notion of writing an autobiography of a London tavern, uh, the Fitzroy Tavern, is a, is a brilliant idea. Um, it, it's fair to say you didn't actually completely write it yourself, did you, the book? Uh, I'm, well, I, I wrote the book myself, but obviously um, it needed a professional to bring it together. And um, yes, I, 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 the way I started to write the book was that my mother lost her sight and when we started to clear out her flat she had this huge bookcase of books all signed by the famous people who came into the pub and because she was blind I was picking the books out and reading them and she said you know there's one of these books dedicated to you and it was by um, a, a, a novelist of, of the 20s and 30s called Nora C. James and in it she dedicated the book to me when I was two and she'd written in it to Sally, hoping that one day she will write a much better book and dedicate it to me. <laughs> what a moment. And I had to make up the challenge. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lovely read, I have to say, as well. And you, and you had a bit of help from, was it your, son, was it your son's idea? No, no. Although, no, no, it was my idea to write it. But my son... Um, got very interested. He even did his O-levels and the subject he submitted to the examiners was doing it on the Fitzroy Tavern, which I thought was rather strange, but they came back with a remark, and this was 18 years after my parents had left the pub, that uh, you, you should use the subject, but to go into the social conditions of the time, etc. And he got an A, which absolutely <laughs> my parents <laughs> <laughs> I bet it did and it's fascinating I mean that the cover of the book in itself is is beautiful it's got I'll just run through some of the now you've got a sort of an illustration yeah. uh, by Dennis Tur uh, Tur Tur Turin. Turin yeah and a cover designed by uh, Adrian Morrill and there are there are basically the regulars in there uh, the list of the list of sort of 14 that, that, that you will know of is there's uh, Dylan yes. Thomas, Betty May, Augustus John, Prince Monolulu, Nina Hamnett, yes. uh, Walter Sickert, uh, Jacob Epstein, Coco the Clown, Tommy Cooper, Bud Flanagan. Uh, and I also found out from reading it that Ralph Reed used to go in there, the father of the gang show, which is kind Ralph, of was my first Reed introduction to it. When, when my father went into the RAF, um, he went uh, down to one of the shows that Ralph Reader was putting on uh, and they got talking and when Ralph Reader came back to London he went in and sought out the Fitzroy, got friendly with my mother and after the war, because uh, the pub became very, very famous for its Pennies from Heaven charity, uh, Ralph Reader came in as director of entertainments and he was absolutely fantastic. Uh, there's a lot about Ralph Reader. Uh, he, he was an amazing man, amazing man. There's some brilliant photographs as well in the in the middle of the book, again of some extremely <laughs> famous literary people. But we're talking about the Fitzroy Tavern. I'm Nick Hennigan. This is uh, Resonance 104.4 FM. Uh, also, of course, a podcast on uh, www.literarylondon.com. 
uh, pubcrawl.com. Uh, Sally Fiber is my guest, and we're talking about the autobiography of a London tavern, the Fitzroy. So let's just sort of do a potted history of the Fitzroy. So, it's, so your grandparents were the first kind of recognised landlords then, effectively, the licensees. They were, they were um, and then um, when my 15 years after my mother married, um, she married Charles Allchild, and my grandfather um, sort of semi-retired. He, he, he went down to live in Hove, but he used to come back every Sunday morning and sit in the bar when the um, local people used to come in when they got their money, the, the tailors particularly, because he originally was a tailor, uh, with their high hats on, and they had their money, and he used, they used to come in and have a drink, and my grandfather used to hand out cigars to them um, when they came in. Uh, but then, when the war was declared, and my father was called up into the RAF, um, a, man was, a woman was not allowed to hold a license on her own. <laughs> so my grandfather had to come back and hold the license for a time until my father came back out of the forces. So, um, you know, for, for nearly for 38 years, the family ran that tavern. It's remarkable, isn't it? I love, I love the fact that it's sort of passed down from father to son. And Pop Kleinfeld, has, he's quite an interesting story himself, didn't he? His roots were fairly uh, humble, to say the least. Absolutely. I mean, he rich, literally came to this country with just four pence in his pocket. And, uh, he, you know, he knew the hard times. And then later on, uh, before the National Health Service was uh, established, there were many Jewish immigrants coming over to this country, and he formed a friendly society which used to help the um, immigrants coming in, you know, with with medical uh, help particularly. And um, it, it was a wonderful thing. I, he was the president, I think, for 15 years until he actually came into the Fitzroy. And the, the, the charity, which is, I know is about to sort of start again, um, Pennies from Heaven, that, that came about through um, the very fortuitous fact that your grandfather, I think, put a darts board, a dart board in the, in, in the bar. That's <laughs> right. The only, only thing to sort of, this darts board was amazing because um, often the customers used to love to play darts in the public bar and one of them got frustrated through his dart on the ceiling and it gave my grandfather an idea and according to my mum he, he didn't go to sleep that night until he perfected a way where he could invite the customers to put their change into the paper in, and form a dart out of it and then throw it on the ceiling and the idea you know attracted everyone they used to love to come in and throw their darts on the ceiling and my mother was only nine, um, I think, seventeen at the time when this started, nineteen twenty-three, and she insisted. Although the pub had been helping a lot of the elderly people in the area, that this money should go to help the needy children, deserving children, in the area, and she particularly wanted it to be used for children of every colour, race, or creed as she said, and this is what it did. They started doing outings to the country, and uh, then these carried on until the outbreak of war, when obviously the money had to, at least the outings had to stop, and um, money went on being collected on the scene all that time. So uh, it was great until after the war, and that, that's another story. This is when Ralph Reader came in and my father looked at the ceiling and he said, if we don't take that money down, we're going to be in trouble. The ceiling's <laughs> going to fall down. <laughs> <laughs> and so they, they decided then to apply for a special license. And after hours, they held pennies from heaven parties where the customers who'd thrown the money on the ceiling, including many, many famous people, um, were then invited to come and take the money down and um, the champagne flowed and there was amazing evenings but they had a problem and my mother knew that much of the money on the ceiling may be out of circulation and so they went to their wonderful Midland Bank who taught my mother how to do the books initially 
and um, they said they would honour the currency. But then there became another problem. As they took it down, it was so dirty, it was unidentifiable, and the banks wouldn't accept the money. So what do you do? Somebody came up with a bright idea in the bank. Take it to Billingsgate Market, the fish market, where they have to wash the money before it can go back into circulation. So they washed the money, and <laughs> they were back, because they were, could use that money again, and they, they were then funded uh, with the money from the ceiling, plus lots and lots of donations from the local people, and also from the stars in Hollywood, and from the Hoyts Theatre in, in Australia sent food parcels because the first parties uh, we were still on rationing so every child received a food parcel from the Hoyts Theatre group in Australia and in fact last year was it last year when we had the floods in Australia maybe two years ago when it was known that it came from the Fitzroy River in Australia I got um, many people sending donations over really to almost repay what Australia had done for us all those years ago and the manager of the Fitzroy now also got his staff on Australia Day to send over money to to Australia. Huh. So Isn't that a lovely story, a kind of circular, uh, <laughs> give, give, give it back? Well it's many many years on but I've never forgot that generosity. It's quite remarkable as well, reading, reading the book, that how much a part of the community the pubs were. I mean, it's an often kind of, often used phrase and not always relevant. But I mean, your, your, was it your parents had a sort of a, a Christmas club to help people out as well, didn't they? They sort of. That's right, that's right. It's one of the first things my, my, my mother did and my grandfather. They decided that uh, they would have this Christmas club and everyone used to come and Nina Hamlet, the famous artist who is known as the Queen of Bohemia, used to sit there doing sketches of the people as they used to line up to, to put in their money every year and uh, it was the sketches she used was actually used on one of her original books, a special edition of her book. Um, and it was amazing because my mother could never understand how quickly she could sketch the people <laughs> as they were lining up. And I quite like the middle bank comes out quite well. <laughs> They're not around anymore, are they? But they didn't uh, didn't they actually open up? Especially on a, uh, all the stuff came in for free on a Sunday, or there was some story there about. That's right. My my mother got very um, uh, concerned because uh, her dog went missing. And she didn't like to leave the money that had been collected um, for the Christmas club in the pub over the weekend because it was something like £3,000, which was a lot of money in the 20s. So she went to the bank and the banks said, oh, I don't know, and went to head office. And they said, well, if somebody would um, volunteer to come in, we will open the bank. <coughs> Apparently, all the staff volunteered to come in. They all volunteered all volunteered to come in and uh, that was the first time that, that and I'm not sure if it was the only time that, that the Midland Bank has ever opened on a Sunday. <laughs> Brilliant. Um, I mean, so uh, just tell us a bit as well, where do you think the, the audience, the audience, that's the wrong term, where did the regulars come from uh, uh, at the Fitzroy Tavern? Well, the, the main people, the, the famous people, the Bohemian crowd, particularly Augustus John and all those came from the Slade and uh, it was really Nina Hamlet who was the first one to find the Fitzroy and then she brought in Augustus John and gradually more and more people started to come in. The local people liked it. They liked the idea of my grandfather who was extremely generous he would listen very carefully to all the stories that the customers came in, was very shrewd. He knew those that were trying it on or not trying it on. <laughs> and often people used to find that their rents had been paid or he'd helped in other ways. Uh, we didn't know this until many years later, that what he, he had been doing for the customers. And of course, if somebody had come in and they'd, 
sold a picture or had a good turn on the on the horses or whatever, then there would be great celebrations and uh, the atmosphere was amazing. Yeah, I've always felt it's a very hard job running the pub. I had a romantic notion of doing it myself a few years ago, but it's uh, it's kind of pretty full on, isn't it? I'm guessing. So, how, how was it for you growing up there? So, what are your earliest memories of the Fitzroy Tavern, having been born upstairs? Well, uh, I do have lots of memories, and I, I I mean, as a child, you're not really allowed into the bar, but of course. When I had to come down to come out, you, you pass the open door into the bar. So often I would meet some of the people, particularly Nina Hamlet and um, Sylvia Goff, who are always sitting there. Um, I remember lots of lots of the customers. I remember Kenneth Horn and Stinkerman. Yeah. Do you remember? Yes, yeah, Kenneth Horn, very funny comedian. Well, just after the war, um, my mother wanted to get me into a boarding school. And uh, she, she, as she came out, she said, oh, bye-bye, I'm just going to go and see a, a school called St. George's. And Kenneth Horne was just sitting by the door and he heard, he said, St. George's? You mean St. George's in Harpenden? So she, he said, yes. So she said, that was my old school. He said, you tell the headmaster you're a friend of mine and you'll get in. <laughs> so I got in. I don't know quite whether it was through him or not or whatever. But I got in and, and I, most of my schooling was done there at St George's because <laughs> it was quite hard to get into a good school at that time. Sally Fiber there talking to me about some of her memories of the Fitzroy Tavern back in 2015. Um, rather sadly, Sally passed away a couple of years after this interview. Um, but I hope uh, you can kind of hear what a joy she was. She was uh, 81 when she passed away um, and she was very kind with uh, with uh, telling me I could kind of use this again and again if I needed to. Um, but I did that especially, as I say, I had an email from, uh, from uh, Chelsea saying, could you run it again? Uh, and it's lovely, isn't it? It's great to hear from her. Um, and we'll do the second half. I think we'll do the second half of the interview uh, next week when she'll talk more about some of the famous personalities that were involved in and around the Fitzroy Tavern and of course where we got the name Fitrovia from hey God, it's all happening isn't it so thank you very much to Sally and to her lovely family for that um, now if you'd like to get in touch as always please feel free it's probably easiest to email um, radio at mavericktheatre.co.uk gets you straight to me yes radio at mavericktheatre.co.uk and, and if you go to the Fitzroy Tavern which is on Charlotte Street uh, in um, London W1 they still have copies of Sally's book upstairs if you'd like to read it or again if you want me to get you a copy then uh, I think we're going to I think they might be on our London Literary pubcrawl.com website uh, I'll check that out for next week have a look www.londonliteraryPubcrawl.com, and then click on the books tab and I think uh, Sally's book is there available to purchase if you so desire it's a great slice of literary history I think right here Yes. So uh, that's all we've got time for this week. Thank you very much again for your company. As I say, check us out on bohemianbritain.com. Uh, yeah, <laughs> why not? Bohemianbritain.com. And again, if there's anything that you're involved in, if you've written a book or a poem or you're involved in the literary life at whatever level in London or actually around the world, yeah, it doesn't really matter. Then again, drop me an email, radio at mavericktheatre.co.uk radio at mavericktheatre.co.uk and that's it from me have a fantastic week I'll see you next time this is Resonance 104.4 FM <laughs>